This morning's scripture reading will come from the book of Romans, chapter 4, chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member one of another. Well, we have been saying it for a long time. It's here. Gospel meeting. We had one of our first lessons this morning. And we have with us here this morning Brother Nathan Franson and his family. They are from Citrus Heights, California. Do they grow citrus out there? Well, we do some here too. <laughs> so, and that. Uh, he will be conducting our gospel meeting this week. We uh, continue to ask that every one of you be able to, if you can, return, bring a friend. We will be meeting again this evening at 6 o'clock, and then Monday through Thursday, we'll be at uh, 7 o'clock each night. And that, so, uh, Brother, brother uh, Nathan, he uh, preaches at the Mariposa Church of Christ there in Citrus Heights, California, he is a graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching. He attended from 07 to 09. And, that, and uh, evidently, he, he knows a few people. You know, he must know Mark. He must know Lance. You know, so he must be good. All right. We're glad to have him here with us. Also, Brother uh, Nathan has with him, he has done a study on Mormonism. And he has flash drives here if you're interested in that. So get with him afterwards, and he will let you know about that. So, Brother Nathan, come speak to us, brother. Tribute to Lance right there. There we go. Um, it is good to uh, be with you and certainly glad to be back in the Chelmet area. Uh, as I mentioned in the Bible class, we uh, were here uh, when, I was in, after, when I was attending the Memphis School of Preaching, and Chelmet was where we came and did a campaign and greatly enjoyed our time here. As far as the gospel meeting, this is kind of the gospel meeting that almost wasn't, I guess. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, several months ago, and I, I, Mark had asked me if I would come, and uh, certainly I was, you know, I was eager to do so. And but we, my understanding was that we never sat down to date. Mark, that we did, and I was probably in the, you know, at fault for that. Uh, and so I never put it on my calendar. And then uh, Lance told me, uh, you know, when I was talking to him one time, he said, uh, he said, hey, I saw you're coming for a gospel meeting. And I said, what? <laughs> I said, what, what are you talking about? And he said, uh, well, we, you know, you're down for this, you know, for these dates. And I said, I didn't know that we nailed that down. So I got worried because I'm like, I don't want to, you know, double book myself or, you know, make, you know, have something else. And so I called Lant, or Mark, rather, and uh, I said, Mark, I said, I am so sorry. I said, I don't know if there was a misunderstanding. I, I said, I had, you know, I, I did not know that I was, you know, that I was coming in October. I didn't know, you know, and uh, Mark said, oh. Can you come in October? <laughs> I said, I said, let me let me check, and uh, got back to him that day, and I'm so glad that uh, we got that straightened out. So uh, that was my fault, but um, I am so glad that uh, you know, to know that Mark. I know he's been down here a long time, and and uh, just the work that he does, and the, and what he means to me, and the encouragement that he has been to me is just means the world. And uh, again, with Lance and Kristen, they have become really good friends of ours, and we've known them for um, several years as well, and so grateful for them. What you see behind me um, is uh, several different um, shapes, and what I would like you to do is to pick one of those shapes, don't change it, just the first one that comes to your mind, and then either you can write it down, you can hang on to it in your mind, whatever it is, but don't do anything with it. You know, like I said, don't change it. There's a reason why... I'm telling you this, and as we, you know, and as you pick those and hang on to them, 
Uh, how many in here with a show of hands remember when COVID hit? And how, you know, we know that uh, it wasn't the easiest thing to navigate. And I, know, I understand that there are a lot of congregations down here that had to shut their doors for some time. We had to do it in California and uh, we didn't want to do it. And I understand also that, you know, we need to be very sensitive to the ones that do uh, because of, you know, the strict government laws or whatever in different places. It was not an easy decision for the elders or the men to make anywhere to have to do that. No one wanted to do it, but we know that there were things that had to happen. There were people that had to stay home for certain periods of time. And um, I'm not sure if you live streamed here uh, while, the, you know, while you were home or whatever the case was. I remember we did it and I would go in and do a lesson with live streaming and so the people could at least, you know, the members could at least watch it and whoever else was there watching as well. But let's face it, uh, streaming was not the same as being there live, was it? I'm a hugger, and I can't, uh, you know, you can't hug a TV, and, you know, it's just, I love, you know, greeting the members and, you know, and seeing different people. And you remember when you started coming back and people finally started, you know, getting comfortable and they were able to open those doors again and they came back and you had that awkward moment where you just go up to them and you're like, oh, okay, I don't know, should we do this? Do we not do this? And you just, like, had that real, you know, the real uncomfortable moment. And, of course, now... Uh, hopefully it's better. But as we were able to meet without all the limitations and, and, you know, and everything started getting back to a sense of normalcy, there was one recurring statement that I kept hearing from members. And that is that I never want to take anything for granted again. We got to a point, I think, uh, that where, you know, and all of us, I think, sometimes we fall short of this, but, you know, we got to a point where I think we take worship so so for granted and just seeing each other and being here and knowing okay Sunday this is where I'm going to be and it becomes such a regular part that it becomes routine and we just and until you start to lose that or until it starts to get disrupted we just don't think a whole lot about it it's just something we do but I want to talk this morning you know looking one of the best ways that we could ever get back to normal and finding that sense of normalcy, but to, you know, to really stop taking things for granted like that is to find a way to contribute in the congregation. If you want to not ever take anything for granted, make sure you're doing something in the congregation. Now, you have your shape here, right? I'm going to close this up so that you can take one last look at it before I close this. All right. What this is is a personality test. And I want to go over the different shapes See which ones you picked and see how different they are. And there's a reason why I'm doing this. The first one, the first shape, how many in here picked the circle? Show of hands. All right. If you're the circle, there's a description for all of these with this test. You're organized. You're hardworking. You love information so much that you have a hard time making decisions because there's just not enough information. How many in here chose the square? Okay, you. If you chose the square, you're beautiful people. You care about other. You're a team player. You love harmony, but you shy away from conflict and confrontation. This is not set in stone. I don't, you know, I don't, want, don't come up to me and say, nah, it has nothing to do with me. With that. Y'all you all can learn something about someone, you know, because they'll say, oh, I'm not like that. And then the next person, you know, they're, the person they're with, they usually say, oh, yeah, yo, I don't know. But... How many chose the triangle? If you chose the triangle, you are a natural born leader. You've got strong, yeah, she's, she's feeling pretty good about that there. You have strong self-confidence. You're not looking for popularity, but you do like the recognition. Now, how many chose the squiggly lines? Wow, a lot of people chose the squiggly line. This is where I never get invited back with this one. <laughs> you chose the squiggly line. Remember, this is not my test. This is I got this from someone else. You have no purpose in life. <laughs> You're creative. 
you have short attention spans, if you're not very detail-oriented, and you are easily distracted, because you can be distracted halfway through this about a shiny object that you see. So. How many chose the rectangle? One person? Rectangle's interesting, because not a lot of people choose the rectangle, but what you don't realize is that more people have the rectangle in common with them. So um, this, you know, the rectangle represents that you're uh, an association with going through a time of change, and that you're looking for answers. Most people go through a rectangle at some time in their life, that you do have to go through that, you know, that time of change, and uh, it's, sometimes it's easier than other times, and so forth. The reason why I gave this is we realize that we have different personalities, don't we? We have different, different strengths, we have different weaknesses, we have different levels of, com uh, of being comfortable in what we do and what we take on, and, and we need to realize that not every person is experienced in all areas in a congregation, or anywhere, or even outside of the congregation. That not everyone is the same. We are different. But make no mistake, every person that is in a congregation has something to contribute. Every one of us. I know a lot of people think, and you know, this kind of goes across the board with wherever I go and you know, whoever we meet, that you know, there are some people that just think, oh, well, I don't have a lot. I don't know what to do. I don't have any, you know, they, they, don't, know, they don't find the areas that they're able to fit, and, so, and therefore they don't feel like they you know, are a great fit in, in, in so many different activities, and that's why they just don't sign up for things or they don't, volunteer is because they're not um, they're not thinking about it but finding our place in a congregation involves doing what we can that's what I want to take a look at this morning is to look at some of these different areas of finding our place in a congregation and realizing that you do have something to offer no matter who you are and what kind of personality you have first and foremost number one is to do what you can to serve. If you look over at 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes these letters, both letters, uh, to a, you know, this group of Christians. They've been, they're being persecuted at this time. And Peter writes these letters to really encourage them, to, to build them up and to lift them up, to edify them, to let them know that you are not alone. All of us are going through this. I'm going through this with you. And he writes this to really sort of, you know, to lift their spirits and to get them understanding this sense of ought that they can have, this purpose that God has given to them. And so you think of this persecuted Christians, and in Second, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, he writes at this part of this letter, he says, You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, as he writes this, this is a metaphor for them right here. And he's telling them that you are this spiritual house. You're the one that's being built up. And you're being built up in different ways. You know, it's interesting when you start looking at this because, you know, these were, you know, so many of these were Jews. The Jews gave a lot of attention and a lot of care to building the temple. Do you remember reading about them and how they, you know, when they built the tabernacle, there were very specific uh, the, the instructions for them. And they paid very close attention to what these were, and they were good at keeping the law. And so they, but, and so they gave very, they gave a lot of close attention to building all, you know, these different buildings, and especially the temple. Every stone was carefully placed. They made sure that, you know, based on the instructions that they were given, by God, that this, this was going to stand and it was going to be fortified and that nothing was going to be able to, to disrupt it. But it also held an idea of service. And you think about how that affects us today. At a bomb baptism, when we decide that I want to turn my life over to the Lord, and we looked at this in, in, you know, in the first hour, but when you decide that you wanted to turn your life over to God, to be baptized, to be added by him to his church, the only church that we find in the New Testament, something happened. You were added to a kingdom with expectations. 
you all of a sudden became a part of something where God expects you to contribute to it. It's not just saying, okay, well, I'm just going to be Christian now, and I'm just going to show up or, you know, potlucks and different activities. It's I'm going to do something to contribute to the work of this local congregation, the one that I place. And it's so, you know, and, and how, how wonderful it is to be able to place your, uh, just to place your commitment to a congregation and say, okay, this is where I want to do the work. You know, you think of, uh, you know, uh, Phoebe, she did it. And you think of Tabitha, she did it. She made sure that she was able to do different things. Not everyone can do the same thing, and we need to be mindful of that. But this added, it held an idea of service with building this. But when we're baptized, we are added to a kingdom with expectations. And there are reasons why when you start looking at a congregation, and, you know, and sometimes it's easier to tell than other ones, you know, I, I, I'm mindful that when you visit a different congregation out of town, you see you know, some of the very best of, you know, of everyone, and it look, everything it looks like is uh, operating on all cylinders, and sometimes it's not the case behind the scenes. And I'm not saying that, it's this, that this is one of them, but uh, sometimes you, you start to learn things about the congregation. But there are reasons why congregations struggle, and it's because they, they place unfair pressure on other people, and they do this in one of two ways. Number one is that we expect everyone to have the same strengths. So many times we expect you know, everyone to have the same strengths, we expect them to have the same abilities, we expect them to have the same knowledge, and we need to be very mindful that it doesn't work like that, does it? I might have a strength that might not be a strength for you. You have something that you're good at that I might not be any good at or that be comfortable with doing. And so we expect all of these people to have the same abilities, we expect everyone to do the same work then with the same results. But if you're placing someone in a position and they have, that's not their expertise or wheelhouse, they're not going to be able to perform or fill that position as good as someone else who has the experience in that. And that's just common sense. No, one, you know, no one's going to hire you for a job if you don't have experience doing you know, whatever it is, especially something, you know, the higher up or the, the more technical it is and, uh, and so forth. But we, we can't expect everyone to have the same results in all areas. That's just not realistic. Number two is that we just do nothing, so others must take the lead. And so we just expect, either expect everyone to do everything, or we just say, well, I'm just, you know, some people just say, well, I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd rather just not do a whole lot and just wait for others to do, sign up on the sheet that's out in the foyer or to, you know, we expect other people to volunteer for everything. But what that does is it starts to put added pressure on the same group of people who a lot of the time do the same things. And they have to wear different hats, even the hats that they might not have any experience in that you might do. Lively stones, as we read about from Peter, make up the household of God. But we also know that not every stone is the same, is it? If you've ever looked at a house and you've looked at the different bricks or the way a house is put together, we know that not every brick looks exactly identical to each other. Now, they might have similarities and some of them look very, uh, you know, very much the same and the same a similar shape, but we know that not every stone is exactly the same. And it's the same as we're looking at with the metaphor that Peter gives to them right here. Lively stones make up the house of God, but they're not all the same. Every stone, but you Every stone, though, has its place, doesn't it? There's a reason why every stone is set where it is. When you look at this in the physical sense, if you were to try to build a house and you left some of the stones out, is it going to be very, is it going to be very dependable when you get it up? No. Every stone is there for a reason. And it depends on the other stones to do their part to hold that structure up. It's the same thing with the household of God. I need to do my part I need to, you know, so that I can depend on the next person to do their part. And here we are as this church family, every person doing something in the congregation that we're good at, that we're experienced with doing. But it depends on the other stones to keep everything steady. And we see this so often when you, you, know, when you start looking at all of these different, these different examples in the New Testament. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 3.
1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 6, Paul writes this, and he's talking about the work of the church right here. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. You notice what's going on right here? This is in the area of evangelism right here. You see, there are planters and there are waterers, aren't there? How many in here... Uh, how many in here have ever gone door knocking? Remember how easy it was that first time you were door knocking? Trying to plant that seed? It wasn't so easy, was it? You get scared. You get intimidated. I remember the first time that I went door knocking, and it was, uh, it was something else. The first time, you know, it was on a campaign. This might have been the one. I, don't, I can't remember if it was here or a different one, but it was the first time that uh, we'd ever gone door knocking when I was at, at the school. And uh, we, were, we were nervous. You didn't know who was going to answer the door or what the reaction was going to be. You had no idea if they were going to be friendly, if they were not going to be friendly. And, uh, you know, so, so we prayed before we went up to, you know, each of the houses. But here's how, here's how our prayer went. We'd knock at the door. Lord, please don't let them be home. <laughs> not the easiest thing, is it? Now, as, it go, as you go on it becomes a little bit more comfortable. It gets easier and easier. But there are some people that, you know, that are great seed planters. They can, meet the, they can meet someone and just instantaneously, they will just, they, they make that connection. It's easy to talk to them. It's easy to plant that seed. And then there are the waterers. Some people are not comfortable being that seed planter. But it doesn't mean that your work is done. You might be a waterer. This, you know, the seed planters have planted that seed. They made that contact. Then they bring someone in, and then you take over. And there are some people that are so good at sitting down with someone and connecting and talking to them and just making them feel comfortable and at home, and they just start studying the Bible together and get, other, you, know, get you interested in the Word of God. They always use the Word of God. Don't ever try to talk someone into the gospel. Let the Word of God do all the work. That's the easiest way to get some, because that's, what's tr that's the truth anyway, is it not? Make sure you get them into the Word. But there are people that are so good at that who can sit down and have that conversation with people. And so you've got, you know, so you've got these seed planters, you've got waterers. They're different, you know, they're people with different skill sets. Because once everyone starts, you know, starts working together and what you are good at and when you realize your place, that's when the Lord starts doing the adding. It's the Lord that's going to do the adding. I can't add anyone. I don't have that authority anyway. But I can talk to someone. And I can introduce them to other people who are really good at getting someone into their home, at inviting them out, getting them into those studies. What an amazing thing that is when the church starts working together for the good of the cause of Christ. But step up to help. Don't just wait for someone else to do, you know, to do all the gardening. Step up to help and find something that you can do in the, con in, in the local congregation. That brings us to number two, is to do what you can to edify the church. And think about this. What, you know, what happens to a plant if you just, you know, if you never take care of it? It's going to die, isn't it? I'm pretty good at killing plants. I, you know, I, you know, I just, that's why I try to water all the time. Our water bill is probably higher than it has to be. But I get real particular about the outside of our house with all of our plants and grass and trees and everything. But, we, but if you don't take care of it, it's going to die. Do what you can to edify the church. Build it up. Let the church thrive because of things that you do. You see, when the welfare of the church becomes the priority, it's going to lead to results. When you start thinking about the church and put the church first and say, this, you know, what can I do? What can I do with the experience that I have? It might not be the experience other people have, but I have it. What can I do? Talk to people and see where you, you, know, where you can be used. But it's going to lead to results. If you look over at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16, Paul writes, From whom the whole body, joined and knit together, 
by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working, by which every part does its share. Look at this right here. When every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Things happen when every person try, can step up and do what you can to help. A lot of people think, well, what, do, you know, what can I do then? I don't, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm not a technical person. I can't do you know, all the tech work. Uh, you know, there's only so many people that can sign up to clean the building. We're certainly grateful for the ones who do come in because the building doesn't take care of itself. We're grateful for those. You know, you go into the restroom and it's a clean restroom and you're so thankful that it doesn't look like a, you know, the gas station across the street. Doesn't, you know, someone's making that happen. But not everyone is making that happen. They have you know, different tasks and different things. But there are ways that you can edify the body. How many in here have ever received a card from someone? Did it mean something to you? I love receiving cards. I'm a big card writer. I write cards. I have a you know, couple of boxes full of cards in my office because I love writing cards to people. But I love getting them. And you know when you get them, it means everything. Why? There, you know, it, it's nice when you get a text, and it's a nice text or an email or whatever. But when someone sits down, think about this, and they have you in mind. You are the recipient of someone thinking about you. And even if it's not a long note, they think enough about you that they're going to sit down, write that card, you know, take it to the post, you know, to the, put it in their mailbox, and they want to make sure that you feel good. If it's your birthday, you feel good. If it's, you know, if it's an anniversary, you like, you know, you appreciate getting those cards. You ever get one of those cards when, you know, when something difficult happens in your life? What an encouragement that is. Or when you just get those cards that just say, you know, just thinking of you. You're on my mind. And it means something to someone when you can write those cards. And it's not just verbal, although we do appreciate, we, we do appreciate the verbal compliments. But when someone receives a card, it is just, it's a game changer. You can write cards. That's something everyone can do to encourage someone else in the congregation. Whether it's writing something to the preacher, whether it's writing something to you know, any of the teacher, the Bible class teachers, writing something to the people who do take care of the building, writing something just to another member to, you know, to try to lift their spirits. Card writing is one of the easiest ways to really jump in and do something to help that the morale of the congregation. You ever received that phone call right at the right time? Having someone call you right at that moment when you probably needed that phone call the most, when you're just going through something and you're stressed out or, or even more, and someone has you on their mind to call you. What a great encouragement that is. You can be the very thing that someone else needs at that particular moment just by calling them talking to them, and sharing time with them. Visit someone at home. I know this was difficult during COVID. It was, you know, a lot of people were very, uh, very nervous about it, but thankfully we're getting back to, you know, to normal. Visit someone at home. Call them, you know, it's probably good to call them first to make sure they're not in a situation that might make them uncomfortable, but call them and visit them. Visit someone in a hospital. Visit someone that you know is going through something. You know, just visit them to just chat. It means everything to know that you are on someone else's mind. Help someone clean. Just call. I know, you know, that's tough. I know a lot of people just think, no, I don't want to be a burden. And if you ask them, hey, can I help clean? They'll probably most likely say, no, I'm okay, and I've got this. Okay, well. You know, I, sometimes you know we get pushing and say, "Nope, I'll be there at this time. I'll just help you with you know do it." You, know, you ought to be careful because you don't want them to just push you out of the house and say, "No, I mean, you know, I meant what I said. I don't want you over here." But see if any, you know, if you can do anything for someone to help clean, to help cook, to help watch children. There's so many different ways we can connect with our church family. Doing what you do best.
even if it's not something tangible, like taking care of the building. Finally, focus on what you can do. Look at what you can do. You know, there's a recurring theme. When you look at Revelation 2 and 3, the churches of Asia, there's a recurring th theme that, you know, that sits in every single one of those congregations. What did the Lord tell them? I know your works. Now, that can be really, you know, that can be a scary thing to have the Lord say that to you. I know your works, because sometimes it might be a wake-up call to change. But nonetheless, the Lord told them. And there were strengths and weaknesses that every congregation had, didn't he? But there's Christ saying, I know your works. And here Christ is in this place saying, guess what, Chalmette? I know your works. I know what your members are doing. I know what they're trying to do. I know what they're not trying to do. And the same thing for where we are, Mariposa Avenue in Citrus Heights. I know your works. What is that going to say to you specifically? If the Lord came to you and asked you, what are you doing? Are you doing what you can? I know you can't do everything. There should never be a time where I should feel satisfied with my effort and just think, you know what, I'm just going to do enough and I don't, just don't have to do any more. There's not a retirement age when you become a Christian. You are a Christian for life, or you should be. If you look at Romans chapter 12, we heard this read earlier. Beginning in verse 4, Paul writes, For as we have many members in one body, how amazing that is. How encouraging that is. We have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. And so we, being many, are one body, one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Folks, never ever taken, take the opportunity to serve for granted. <laughs> Push yourself. Look for ways to leave your comfort zone. Be the one to fill a need. If you want it to feel normal again, get to worship services and do something in the congregation. You see, you can leave here today with the attitude that you can't do anything or you can decide you can't do everything but you can do something. You're added to Christ, by Christ, to his church. Make no mistake that you me, every one of us has something valuable to add. And the reward is like you can't even imagine. Are you doing it? You, will you be with him on the other side of this life? If you're unsure, you don't need to be. If you're unsure if you're doing enough and or if you, you know, have any concerns about it, make today the day that you change. Make today that you make that commitment and say, you know what, this is the day I'm going to start doing something about it. Let's take care of it today. And if for no other reason, I want to encourage you to come forward to commit to the work at Chalmette. You have that chance. As together we stand and sing.